Today, we are doing SAT practice test one, a math walkthrough of the calculator section. We are also going to show you tons of SAT math tips, tricks, and hacks. So remember to like or subscribe and let's dive in. Okay, question number one is a chart reading question. John runs at different speeds as part of his training program. The graph shows his target heart rate at different times during his workout. On which interval is the target heart rate strictly increasing than strictly decreasing? Okay, as always, we write down what we're being asked. We need to find where the chart goes up and then down. Here's the thing, strictly means only. So the graph must move first up and then down. It can't move sideways. Well, that's right there. That is answer choice B between 40 and 60 minutes. Notice that this was a lot about reading very, very carefully. Whenever you have a chart question, slow down and read carefully. Okay, next question. Question number two, if y equals kx, where k is a constant, and y equals 24 when x equals 6, what is the value of y when x equals 5? And boy, does this seem like a really complicated question. And boy, it's really not. First thing we always do is write down what we're being asked for. The question is, what does y equal when x equals 5? That step alone makes this thing a lot easier to handle. Turns out, this is a classic direct relationship question. And as soon as you get one of these, what we do is we use the information we're, we're given to solve for K, and then we plug in and solve for Y. It works like this. So we're told that Y equals KX, and that when Y is 24, uh, X is six. So we plug those values in for X and Y, and we get K equals four. Woohoo! Now we know what K is. So now we just plug in four for K and five for x, because we want the value of y when x equals 5. And when we plug those values in, we find that y equals 20. Nice job. Answer choice C. Question 3. In the figure above, lines L and M are parallel, and lines S and T are par parallel. If the measure of angle 1 is 35, what is the measure of angle 2? OK, so we need to find the measurement of angle 2 what this is asking you, as soon as you see the words parallel lines and angles, they're asking you if you know this, that when parallel lines intersect, there are only two types of angles that get created, big and small. Every single big angle is identical and every single small angle is identical. And here's the thing, any big angle, like angle two, plus any small angle, like angle one, will equal 180 degrees. So that means that angle one plus angle two equals 180 degrees. And guess what? They told us the measurement of angle one. Angle one is 35 degrees. So it must be that 35 degrees plus angle two equals 180 degrees. Angle two must equal 145 degrees. That is answer choice D. If 16 plus 4x is 10 more than 14, what is the value of x? Okay, what we're really being asked for is what is the value of 8x? And we always write down what we're being asked for. So the other thing that they're trying to do is see if you can translate their deliberately confusing English into math. And it's not very hard to do in this case, so here's how you do it. The English they give you is 10 more than 14. That means equals 10 plus 14. So something is going to equal 10 plus 14. The English they give you is 16 plus 4x is 10 more than 14. In math, that means 16 plus 4x equals 10 plus 14, or 16 plus 4x equals 24, or 4x equals 8, or x equals 2. Is that our answer? No, it's not. We're not being asked for what x is. We are being asked for what 8x is. 8x equals 16, or answer choice C. Remember, always write down what you're being asked for. Okay, good job. Question number five is asking, which of the following graphs best shows a strong negative association between D and T? So what you're really being asked for is, do you know what a negative association looks like on a graph? 
And so here's what they do. Positive associations look like they're up and to the right. Negative associations look like they're down and to the right. And low associations look like they're just kind of a, a straight line. And random associations just look like there's no pattern at all. Now, in this case, we are looking for a negative association. So we need a pattern that looks like it's kind of down and to the right. And that is answer choice D. Number six is really a converting units type of question. We're told that one decagram equals 10 grams and a thousand milligrams equals one gram. And they're telling us a hospital stores one type of medicine in a two decagram container. Based on the information given in the box above, how many one milligram doses are there in a one two decagram container? And boy, does that seem incredibly confusing. Don't worry, we'll take it step by step and it's gonna be easy. The first thing I always want you to do on every single question, write down what the heck you've just been asked to find. And what we've been asked to find is how many milligrams are there in two decagrams? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out how many milligrams there are in one decagram, and then we're just gonna multiply it by two. So we have 1000 milligrams equals one gram, okay? And then one gram by 10 equals one decagram. So if we take 1000 milligrams, multiply it by 10, that must be one decagram. So that mean, must mean 10,000 milligrams are in one decagram. We're being asked about two decagrams. So we'll multiply that by two. So there must be 20,000 milligrams in one decagram. That's answer choice D. Remember, don't freak out. Always write down what you're asked for, then take things step by step. It's usually easier than you think. Okay, number seven is telling us the number of rooftops of solar panel installations in five cities is shown in the graph above. Okay, if the total number of installations is 27,500, what is an appropriate label for the vertical axis of the graph? And boy, does that sound confusing, but actually, it's not. We're always going to start in the same place we always start. We write down what we've just been asked to find, which is really how many installations should be labeled on the graph. This is a pretty classic SAT type graph question. In other words, the graph represents only a portion of the 27,500. And our job is to figure out what we have to multiply by in order to get it to 27,500. In other words, we add up what A plus B plus C plus D plus E is on the graph using the labels as shown, and then we just have to figure out what we have to get to to get to 27,500. It's easier to do than it is to talk about. So on the graph as written, A equals nine, B equals five, C equals six, D equals four, E, Looks like it's 3.5. If we add all those up, we get to 27.5. But there weren't 27.5 installations done. There were 27,500 installations done. So what do we have to multiply the 27.5 by in order to get to 27,500? I like to just count decimal places. So we need to move the decimal over three spots to get to 27,500. Three decimal places means we multiply by a thousand. That is answer choice C. Nice job. Question number eight is asking for what value of N is the absolute value of N minus one plus one equal to zero. That seems confusing, but we always start where we always start by writing down what the heck we were just asked for. We need to find a value of N that makes that phrase equal zero. What you're actually being tested on is this. They're seeing if you know that anything that's inside absolute value brackets is by definition positive. It's greater than zero. So that means n minus one. I don't know what that number is, but it's always gonna be a positive number because it's inside the absolute value brackets. So if we start with a positive number, n minus one, and it's gotta be positive, and we add one to it, it's always gonna be bigger than zero, always. So there's no value for n that will make that expression zero. Answer choice, D. Question nine gives us a formula and then tells us a little bit about it. It says the speed of a sound wave in air depends on the air temperature. 
okay? The formula above shows the relationship between A, which is the speed in feet per second, and T, which is the air temperature. And then it's asking us which of the following expresses the air temperature in terms of the speed of the sound wave. And this seems all very confusing, but it's really not. First thing we're going to do is we're going to pick out what the heck we've actually been asked to do. And in this case, we need to express air temperature in terms of speed. That means we need to isolate T, which is temperature, on one side of the equation. So we want something that looks like T equals a bunch of stuff. So what they're really being asked to, what you're, they're really testing you on is, do you know how to move stuff around in the equation until T is all alone on one side of the equation? Usually we start with the plus and minus stuff and then do, then do the multiplication and division stuff. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to move the 1052 over to the other side of the equation. And then we're going to divide by 1.08 and that gets T all alone. And that looks like answer choice A. Okay, good job. Question 10 is giving us the very same little equation that they gave us in question nine, and it's telling us the speed of a sound wave in air depends on the air temperature, right? The formula above shows the relationship between A, which is the speed, and T, which is the air temperature. And then it's asking us at which of the following air temperatures will the speed of a sound wave be closest to 1,000 feet per second? Okay, this seems confusing until you think about it a little bit and you understand that all they're asking you is what is the value of T when the value of A equals 1,000? Okay, how did we get there? It's actually pretty easy. So this type of question, it's a model question. This little formula models something in real life. In this case, the relationship between the speed of a sound wave and the air temperature. On model questions, the very first thing I want you to do is ignore all the words. Just pick out the variables and write down what they mean. In this case, A equals speed and T equals temperature. Now it's a lot easier to see that what you're being asked for is when A is 1,000, what is T? So all we're going to do is substitute in 1,000 for A. And then we're just going to solve. And when we do that, what we get is T equals negative 48. That's answer choice B. Nice job. Okay, question 11 is asking you which of the following numbers is not a solution of the inequality 3x minus 5 is greater than or equal to 4x minus 3. The SAT loves this not a solution. What that means is three of these answer choices totally works, but one of these answer choices doesn't, and that's going to be the solution. So to find which answer choice doesn't work, all we're going to do is solve the inequality in C. So we have 3x minus 5 is greater than or equal to 4x minus 3. We're going to subtract 3x from each side, and we're going to get negative 5 must be greater than or equal to x minus 3. That means x has to be less than or equal to negative 2. Well, let's see. Guess what? Negative 1 is not less than or equal to negative 2. Negative 1 is actually greater than negative 2. Answer choice A. Okay, number 12 gives us a chart, and then it asks this question. Based on the histogram above, histogram really, histogram is a chart. Based on the chart above of the following, which is the closest to the average number of seeds per apple? Okay, we always, always, always write down what we've been asked to find. So we need the average number of seeds per apple. In math, that means this, the total number of seeds divided by the total number of apples. Remember the word per means divide. Okay, now our marching orders are actually pretty straightforward. We need to find the total number of seeds and we need to find the total number of apples. Um, so the total number of apples is 12, like they just you know, told us that, so that's easy. The total number of seeds is a little trickier because what we have to do is multiply the number of seeds times the number of apples. So the, there are three seeds and two apples, for example, so that's three times two. There were five seeds and four apples, so that's four times five, etc. And when we do that, what we find is that we get 73 divided by 12, and that turns into 6.08. That's answer choice C. Nice job. 
Okay, question 13 gives us a pretty big chart and then it gives us just a ton of words. It says a group of 10th grade students responded to a survey that asked which math course they were currently enrolled in. The survey data were broken down as shown in the table above. Which of the following categories accounts for approximately 19% of all the survey respondents? Okay, the first thing you always wanna do, especially when they give you a ton of words, is just pick out exactly what you've just been asked to do. We need to find which of the following categories accounts for 19% of all of the survey respondents. And they tell us that the number of survey respondents is 310. So we need to know which group makes up 19% of 310. Okay, well, what is 19% of 310? That's 310 times 0 0.19, it's 57. So we're looking for a group that's gonna be about 57 students in it. And it looks like that's actually gonna be answer choice C, males taking geometry. Boy, we would have loved it if they would have told us males taking algebra two, but they didn't give us that. They gave us females taking algebra two. The closest answer we have are males taking geometry. That is answer choice C, nice job. Question 14 gives you a chart and then a whole heck of a lot of words. The table above lists the links to the nearest inch of a random sample of 21 brown bullhead fish. Okay, the outlier measurement of 24 inches is an error. Okay, so that's not right. Of the mean, median, and range of the values listed, which will change the most if the 24 inch measurement is removed from the data? Okay, so what they're really asking you is do you know the mean, the median, or the range, which is most sensitive to an outlier. So this is how it works. The median, it's not sensitive at all to outliers. The mean is somewhat sensitive to outliers, and the range, which is literally calculated, the biggest value minus the smallest value, is really sensitive to outliers because an outlier is either gonna be the biggest value or the smallest value. So answer choice C, the range is going to be the most sensitive, the most affected by outliers. Okay, good job. Okay, so uh, question 15, we're given a graph. We're told that the graph above displays the total cost C in dollars of renting a boat for H hours. So this is a model question. This graph models or describes some real life behavior, which is how much it costs to rent this boat. So the question is, what does the C-intercept represent in a graph? So what they're really asking you is, is do you know what the first point means when you're graphing a model? Here is how it works. In a model graph, the first point is always the starting point. In this case, it's the starting price of running the boat. If you don't take the boat into the water at all, it's still gonna cost you five bucks. And then you add on more and more dollars the longer you take the boat out. But initially, it's gonna cost you five bucks. That is answer choice A, the initial cost of running a boat. If you're more mathematically minded, you can think of the y-intercept as the constant. And as we know in model questions, the constant is usually the starting point. Okay, good job. Okay, question 16 gives us the same graph that we got in question 15, and it says the graph above displays the total cost C in dollars of renting a boat for H hours, and it's asking us which of the following represents the relationship between H and C, so it's really saying which equation represents the graph, or in other words, we need an equation that produces a cost of eight when hours H are one, a cost of C of 11 when hours H are two, and a cost C of 14 when hours H is three, etc. Now there are a couple ways we could do this. We could plug in H's into each answer choice and see which one gives us the right value for C. That would totally work, it would just take a long time. There's a better way. So we know for sure the answer has to be either B or C because we're in a model question and we know that the constant is five because that's where the line crosses the y-axis. And we also know that in models, constants are bolted onto the equation with a plus or minus sign. So only answer choice B and C have a five bolted onto the equation. So we just have to check those two answer choices. And when we do, we find that only answer choice C 
produces a value of 8 when we plug in the number 1 for H. So it's answer choice C. Nice job. Okay, question 17 gives us a really confusing graph followed by like really confusing language. The complete graph of the function f is shown in the xy plane above for what value x is the value of f of x at its minimum. And oh my gosh, does that seem really confusing? And oh my gosh, it's really not. All they're asking you is which x value corresponds to the lowest y value. Just remember that f of x or g of x or h of x, just a fancy way of saying y. So let's see, we need to find the lowest point. That's the lowest y point is right there. And that corresponds to x at negative three. So that just puts it answer choice B, easy peasy. So question 18 has more to do with deciphering their confusing English than it does with math. So they give us a couple of equations and then they tell us, in the xy plane, if zero, zero is a solution to the system of inequalities above, which of the following relationships between A and B must be true? Sounds very intimidating, but all it's saying is this. If X and Y both equal zero, what can we tell about A and B? And the tip off is you're told that zero, zero is a solution to the system of inequalities above. What that means is the inequalities work if X equals zero and Y also equals zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in zero for X and Y in each equation, and then we'll find out what the relationship between A and B is. It should be pretty easy. So that's our first equation. We'll plug in zeros, and what we get is that A is greater than zero. Okay, we're going to do the very same thing for the second equation. We're going to plug in zero for Y and zero for X. Uh, we do that, and we find out that B is less than zero. So we know that A is greater than zero, and B is less than zero. I think that means A must be bigger than B, which is answer choice A. Okay, nice job. Question 19 is a classic two variable word problem. This comes up all the time. The SAT loves these. A food truck sells salads for $6.50 each and drinks for $2 each. The food truck's revenue from selling a total of 209 salads and drinks in one day was $836.50. How many salads were sold that day? Okay, the first thing we always do is write down what we're being asked for. We need to find the value of S or how many salads were sold. Okay, next thing we do is we write down the variables, then we read very literally and take and make two easy math equations. So what we're told is S equals the number of salads, and we're told that salads cost $6.50. D, that's the number of drinks, and we know that drinks cost $2. So if you have two variables, you have to make two equations. In this case, we know that we sold a total of 209 salads and drinks. So that must mean that S plus D equals 209. We're also told that the revenue, the total number of dollars the food truck made was $836.50. So that must mean if you take 650 times the number of salads we sold, because each salad goes for 650, and you take the number of drinks we sold, D, times $2, because that is the price of a drink, you can get $836.50. So now what we can do is we can add or subtract the equations to get the answer. So look what we do here. So that's the first equation. We are going to multiply the second equation up by 2, because when we do that, look what we get. 2S plus 2D equals 418. And why the heck does that work in our favor? Now we can subtract the equations and something very cool happens. We get 4.5s. 2d minus 2d, there are no more d's anymore, equals 418.5. So now all we do is a little math and we see that s equals 93. That is answer choice B. Nice job. Okay, number 20 is just plain confusing, but there's actually a very easy way to do these that I'll show you. So Alma bought a laptop computer at a store that gave a 20% discount off its original price. Oh, go Alma, sounds like a great deal. The total amount she paid to the cashier was P dollars. 
including an 8% sales tax on the discounted price. Which of the following represents the original price of the computer in terms of P? Okay, so the first thing we always do is we write down what the heck we've just been asked to find. Which of the following represents the original price of the computer in terms of P? What that means is we need an equation that has the original price in terms of the price paid, or we need O equals a bunch of math stuff, P. All right, so the easiest way to do this is just assume that the original starting price is 100 bucks then take it step by step. So O, the original starting price, we're gonna say that's 100. P, that's the price that Alma actually paid, and we need to figure that out because Alma got a whole bunch of discounts and stuff. So let's see. So first off, Alma got a 20% discount off the original price. So that's the original price times 0.8. She didn't pay full price, she paid 80% of the original price. She got a 20% discount. So that means she didn't pay $100. She paid $100 times 0.8. She paid $80. But we're not done yet because she also paid sales tax. So that is the original price times the 0.8, but we need to tack on 8%. In math, that's O times 0.8 times 1.08. For us, that's 80 bucks because that's what she paid times 8% sales tax, which is 1.08, or she actually paid $86.4. Nicely done, Alma. Now, what we need to do is we plug in 86.4 into each equation for P and see which one gives us the original price of 100, right? Because this is O equals something, and we know O. O is 100. So when we do that, O equals 86.4 over 0.8, 1.08. And that is going to be answer choice D is going to give us 100 when we plug in 86.4 for P. Okay, good job. Question 21 uses more charts and words that you could possibly need for a question that's actually fairly easy. So we're given this chart and then we're told. The data in the table above were produced by a sleep researcher studying the number of dreams people recall when they're asked to record their dreams for one week. All right? Group X consisted of 100 people who observed early bedtimes, and group Y consisted of 100 people who observed later bedtimes. If a person is chosen at random from those who recalled at least one dream, what is the probability that the person belonged to group Y? All right, what we always do, especially the more confusing the question, we pick out what the heck it is that we've just been asked. We need, of all the people who recalled one or more dreams, what are the chances that they belong to group Y? This is a probability question, and probability is always calculated the same way, and it's really straightforward. It's just the number of desired outcomes over the number of possible or total outcomes, or in this case, what it is, is the, the group Y folks who recalled one or more dreams over the total number of folks who recalled one or more dreams. So let's see, the group Y folks who recalled one or more dreams, that is 11 plus 68. And the total folks who recalled one or more dreams, that's 39 plus 125. So we do that math, we get 79 over 164, that is answer choice. C. Question 22 is another one that has more to do with tricky English than with math. So they give you a chart and then what they're asking you is, which of the following best approximates the average rate of change in the annual budget for agriculture and natural resources in Kansas from 2008 to 2010? So as always, we need to write down first what the heck we've just been asked to find. So we need the average rate of change per year from 2008 to 2010. So rate of change per year means this in math. It's the new value, 2010 value, minus the original value, it's 2008 value, divided by the total number of changes. And there are two changes, because we went from 2009, that's one change, to 2010, that's the other change. So we're just gonna populate the numerator and denominator and do the math. 
So let's see, that is those, that's the line we're looking at because that's agriculture national resources. The new one is 488, 106, minus 358, 708. We do that math, boom, boom, and we get 64,699. That is about 65,000. That's answer choice B. Nice job. Question number 23 is hoping to use a fancy chart to confuse you and a bunch of fancy words in the question to try and confuse you. But don't worry, this is actually pretty straightforward. You're not going to get confused. Of the following, which program's ratio of its 2007 budget to its 2010 budget is closest to the human resources budget's ratio of 2007 to its 2010 budget? Okay, so always pull out what the heck you're being asked. So we need the closest ratio of HR 2007 to 2010. So what is the HR ratio 2007 to 2010? Well, let's see. It is about four to six, it looks like to me. 2007 was a, was a little over four. 2010 was a little under six. So we'll call that two to three. So we need one of these budgets, agriculture, natural resources, education, highways, transportation, public safety, one of these has a ratio that's also about two to three. And which one is it? Uh, it looks like education. Boy, that's two to three right there. That is answer choice B. Okay, question 24 is just an equation of a circle question, and this does come up from time to time, and they're basically asking you, what is the equation of the circle with the points that they give you, and that's not a problem. First, we start out with the equation of a circle, which is just this, and it's worth memorizing. It's x minus h squared plus y minus k squared, and the whole thing equals the radius squared. H is the X center point of the circle. K is the Y center point of the circle. And notice this equation doesn't equal the radius of the circle. It equals the radius squared of the circle. And that's super important. They just love to test that. Okay, well, they just tell us flat out that the center points of the circle are 0, 4. So we're just going to plug those points right into the equation. Put 0 in for H, 4 in for K. And we know that all of that equals R squared. Okay, so let's do some algebra. Let's clean it up a little bit. And at this point, you can look at the answer choices and see for sure it has to be either A or C because B and D both have a plus sign in front of the four and we need a minus sign. So how do we choose between A and C? Well, there are actually two ways to do it. There's this kind of test savvy way to do it that's really fast, and there's also a way to calculate the exact number if that makes you feel a little bit better. So let's take a look at the test savvy way first. So what we're being asked to choose is if R squared is 25 over nine, or is R squared five over three? Well, the first thing I notice is that 25 over nine is five over three squared. So I'm putting my money on 25 over nine because the formula doesn't give us the value of R, remember, it gives us the value of R squared and 25 over nine is what you get when you square five over three. So now if that makes you a little bit uncomfortable and you want definitive proof that R squared is in fact 25 over nine, we can do that. So what we're gonna do is, you know, let's draw a chart. So we know the center point of the circle is here at zero four, okay? And we know that the radius touches this point, four thirds, five. And this is actually a good exercise because the test frequently puts you in the position of figuring out some diagonal distance on the XY coordinate plane. And when they do that, I want you to think right triangles and Pythagorean theorem. So we know the distance here must be one, and we know the distance here must be four thirds. So what's the distance of this diagonal of the radius? Well, Pythagorean theorem to the rescue. One squared plus four, three, plus four thirds squared must equal R squared. We do a little bit of algebra, boom, 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 click, 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 and guess what? We find out that R squared is in fact 25 over nine, which is answer choice A. Very well done. Okay, number 25 is a model question. And remember, a model question is just an equation that represents something in real life. And in this case, it's how long a ball stays in the air. So the equation above expresses the approximate height h in meters of a ball t seconds after it's launched vertically upward from the ground with an initial velocity of 25 meters per second after approximately how many seconds 
Will the ball hit the ground? Okay, what the heck have we just been asked to find? What we need to find is how many seconds. So we're searching for t when the ball hits the ground. So that must mean, what is the time t when the ball hits the ground? So that must mean that h, the height, is zero. On model questions, we always, always ignore all the words and pull out and write down the variables. So h is the height of the ball, t is the time of the ball in the air. Then we need to rephrase the question like this. What is time when h is zero? Now it's pretty easy because you know what we're going to do? We're going to plug in zero for h and solve for t. So we're going to do a little bit of math. Ah, we get to break stuff up because we're in multiplication. We love that. The left side is 4.9 times t times t. The right side is 5 times 5, that's 25 times t. Hey, there are no plus or minuses, so now we get to cross stuff off from each side, and we find out that t is 5. Answer choice D. Nice job. Question 26, they're hoping they can use confusing percents language to have you get this question wrong, but don't worry, the confusing percents language actually isn't all that confusing. I'll show you how it works. So Katrina is a botanist studying the production of pears by two types of pear trees. She noticed that type A trees produce 20% more pears than type B trees did. Based on Katrina's observation, if the type A trees produced 144 pears, how many pears did the type B trees produce? Okay. As always, always write down what you've been asked to find. We need to find B. We need to find out how many pairs the type B tree produced. So remember, English into math with percents, 20% more means multiply by 1.2. So what we're going to do, simply, slowly, and literally translate the English that they gave us in the question into simple math equations. So type A trees produced, so that A equals... 20% more pairs than type B trees did. So A equals 1.2 B. Okay, so type A produced 144 pairs. So A is out, 144 is in, and then we know that 144 must equal 1.2 B. We can solve for B, 120. Nice job. Okay, number 27 is a classic SAT chart question where the chart only represents a portion of the total. Here, here's how it works. So a square field measures 10 meters by 10 meters. 10 students each mark off a randomly selected region of the field. Each region is a square and has side lengths of one meter and no two regions overlap. The students count the earthworms contained in the soil to a depth of five centimeters beneath the ground surface in the region. The results are shown in the table below. <sighs> Which of the following is a reasonable approximation of the number of earthworms to a depth of five centimeters beneath the ground surface in the entire field? Oh my gosh, okay. Way too much information, really confusing. We always start at the same place. What the heck are we being asked for? We need to find an approximation of the total number of worms in the entire field. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna compare the size of the total field to the portion that the students sampled. Now we're told that the total field is 100, is 100 square meters because it's 10 by 10. But the students, they didn't sample all 100 square meters. The students sampled only 10 square meters because they said that each of the regions had a one by one square, okay? So that means the students, they sampled one tenth of the total. How many total worms did the students count? 1,470. So 1,470 must be one-tenth of the total worms in the field. That means the total worms must be about 14,700. Just multiply it by 10. That's about answer choice C, about 15,000. Okay, nice job. So on question 28, they are counting on this idea that somehow graphing inequalities is like super confusing and hard. The problem is it's just not, and I'm gonna show you how to do it really easily. So if the system of inequalities, y greater than or equal to 2x plus 1, and y greater than 1 half x minus 1 is graphed in the xy plane above, which quadrant contains no solutions to the system? Okay, well, that seems properly intimidating, but the first thing we're going to do is simply pull out what the heck we've been asked to find. So we know that one of these quadrants won't contain any values. So what we're going to do is first, 
we're just going to draw the lines. So we're going to draw in the line, we're going to ignore the inequalities, and we're going to draw the line y equals 2x plus 1, and that's going to look like that. And then we're going to draw on the line y equals 1 half x minus 1. Again, just ignore the inequalities. Okay, so here's what they're asking. Inequalities indicate that we're interested in the stuff either above or below the lines. x greater than means we want the area that is above both lines. So it's this area right here. It has to be above both lines. So now all we have to say is, well, there are no arrows in this quadrant. Quadrant 4 doesn't have any values. That means it's answer choice C. Nice job. So question 29 is all about seeing if you know how to divide polynomials. Here's the thing. Dividing poly polynomials takes a lot of time and effort to explain, and there's a very, very, very low chance that you'll ever see anything like it on the actual SAT. So here's what I want you to do. You are much better off spending your time studying elsewhere, so just don't worry about this one. So you'd think question 30 is asking you, do you know how to express parabolas as equations? And it kind of is, but it's kind of testing on something a little dumb too, but here's how it works. Which of the following is an equivalent form of the equation of the graph shown in the xy plane above from which the coordinates of vertex A can be identified as constants in the equation? So what you're really being asked for is which equation describes the parabola, but the vertex coordinates, the coordinates A, have to be constants, have to be real numbers in the equation. Okay, so let's see where the vertex is and then see which equation uses those points correctly as constants. So remember that the vertex equation form of a parabola is y equals a times x minus h squared plus k, and the x-coordinate of the vertex is the opposite of h and the y-coordinate of the vertex is k. That's really what you're being tested on here. So the vertex of uh, is point a, and that seems to be at about point 1, negative 16. So it looks like answer choice d uses the correct numbers in the equation to describe a vertex at 1, negative 16, because it's using negative 1, negative 16. So the correct answer is d. Good job. So question 31 is really a rate question, which is in fact just a ratio question. Here's how it works. Wyatt can husk at least 12 dozen ears of corn per hour, and at most 18 dozen ears of corn per hour. Based on this information, what is a possible amount of time in hours that it could take Wyatt to husk 72 dozen ears of corn? Okay, so what we're being asked is why it's time to husk 72 dozen ears of corn, and they're giving us a rate, and rates in is SAT code for make ratios. So the first ratio we're gonna make is 12 over one, because we know he can do 12 dozen ears in one hour, and that equals 72 over X, because we're wondering how long it's gonna take him X time to do 72 ears of corn. So all we do is just cross multiply and do a little bit of math, and we find out that X equals six. So if he's working at a rate of 12 dozen per hour, it will take him six hours to do 72 dozen ears of corn. All right, we're gonna do the very same thing, but the other ratio is gonna be 18 over one equals 72 over X. We're gonna cross multiply again, and we're gonna do the math, and we're gonna find out that if he was working at a rate of 18 dozen per hour, it would take him four hours to do 72 dozen years of corn. So the answer has to be somewhere between four hours and six hours, and to be safe, I would probably put in five hours on the test. Okay, good job. Question 32 is a classic word problem. They're just throwing words at you, but after you get them out of their confusing English and into math, it's actually pretty simple. So let's read it. The posted weight limit for a covered wooden bridge in Pennsylvania is 6,000 pounds. A delivery truck that is carrying X identical boxes, each weighing 14 pounds, will pass over the bridge. If the combined weight of the empty delivery truck and its driver is 4,500 pounds, what is the maximum possible value for X that will keep the combined weight of the truck driver and boxes below the bridge's posted weight limit? Phew. Okay, tons of words there. All we're interested in is picking out first 
what we've just been asked for. So what we've been asked to find is what is the biggest value for X? What is the most number of boxes that this truck can carry and still keep it under 6,000 pounds? So we can think of it as like the truck T plus the driver D plus a number of 14 pound boxes with that 14 X has to be less than 6,000 or in straight math, T plus D plus 14 X has to be less than 6,000. And they tell us a few things. They tell us that the truck plus the driver combined is 4,500 pounds. So let's just substitute in 4,500 for D plus D and we get 4,500 plus 14 X has to be less than 6,000. Do a little bit of math, 14 X is less than 1,500. That means X, the total number of boxes has to be less than 107.14 so the maximum number of boxes we can have is 107. Okay, question 33, eh, this has to do more with English than it does with math. So we're given a chart and it says, according to the line graph above, the number of portable media players sold in 2008 is what fraction of the number sold in 2011? So we're being asked for a fraction or a ratio. And so we need the players sold in 2008 is what fraction of the number sold in 2011? In math, that means the number of 2008 players over the number of 2011 players. And there's a couple ways to keep that straight. Um, the first way is to think of it as the numerator is always the part and the denominator is always the whole, or you can think of it as the numerator is is and the denominator is of. In this case, players sold in 2008 is what fraction of the number sold in 2011. So all we do are, is we find those numbers for 2008, 2011, there they are on the chart. We plug them in, we do the math, and we find out that it is five over eight, which is the same thing as 0.625. Okay, good job. Okay, number 34 is totally relying on tricky English rather than tricky math. Here's how it works. A local television station sells time slots for programs in 30 minute intervals. If the station operates 24 hours per day, every day of the week, what is the total number of 30 minute time slots the station can sell for Tuesday and Wednesday? Okay, that's a lot of confusing language, but what we're gonna do is just pick out what the heck exactly we've been asked for. So we need to know how many 30 minute intervals there are in two days, in 48 hours, because all we care about are 30 minute time slots on Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay, well, let's think about it. In 48 hours, there are a total of 48 one hour increments. So there must be twice as many half hour increments. So 48 times two is 96 and the answer is 96. Question 35 looks like a geometry question, but in reality, it's a bit more of an algebra question. A dairy farmer uses a storage silo that is in the shape of the right circular cylinder above. If the volume of the silo is 72 pi cubic yards, what is the diameter of the base of the cylinder in yards? Okay, what are we being asked to find? We need the diameter of a cylinder that has a volume of 72 pi and a height of eight. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug in 72 and eight into the volume of a cylinder formula and then just solve for the radius. And after we have the radius, we'll double it to get the diameter. So it is geometry because you have to know the volume of the cylinder uh, formula, which is pi times r squared times h. So what we're gonna do is just plug in 72 pi for the volume of the cylinder because that's what we're told it is equals pi times r squared times eight because we're told the height is eight. And now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna do math. So pi uh, cancels out on each side. We have 72 equals r squared times eight. Divide each side by eight. We have nine equals r squared. Three equals r. So we know the radius is three. That must make the diameter six. Nice job. Question 36 is really about knowing one math term and then just doing a ton of algebra. So what it's asking is for what value X is the function H above undefined? What that really says is which value for X makes the denominator equal zero because undefined just means that the denominator equals zero. Okay, well, let's find out. So there's the denominator. We just need to solve for X and make it equal zero. 
So that's the first step is doing x minus 5 squared, turning it into that. Here's the thing. Do you remember this thing? a minus b uh, squared equals a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. That's a handy shortcut here because that's exactly what we can do with x minus 5 squared. That turns into x squared minus 2 times x times 5 plus 5 squared. All right, next step, combine all those terms. After that, we're still combining terms. Then we get to this x squared minus 6x plus 9. Reverse FOIL that to x minus 3 times x minus 3 equals 0. So we get x minus 3 equals 0 or x equals 3. Okay, good job. Question 38 is really asking if you understand what the compound interest formula is. So Jessica opens a bank account that earns 2% interest compounded annually. Her initial deposit was $100, and she uses the expression 100 times x raised to the t to find the value of the account after t years. And the question is, what is the value of x in that expression? So what you're really being asked for is, what is the value x in the compound interest formula and the compound interest formula is this so the total amount of money you have equals the principal times one plus the interest rate raised to the number of times it's compounded so in this case the principal is 100 the interest rate is two percent or 0 0.02 so the answer is x is one plus the interest rate or 1.02 And finally, question 38 is all about doing the compound interest rate formula a lot. So Jessica opens a bank account that earns 2% interest compounded annually. Her initial deposit was $100, and she uses the expression 100 times x raised to the t to find the value of the account after t years. Now Jessica friends, Jessica's friend, Tashawn, found an account that earns 2.5% interest compounded annually. Tashawn makes an initial deposit also of $100 into this account at the same time Jessica does, and after 10 years, how much more money will Tashawn's initial deposit have earned than Jessica's initial deposit? And you're supposed to round your answer to the nearest cent or the nearest one hundredth. Ignore the dollar sign when gritting your response. Okay, so what you're being asked is you need Tashawn's total dollars minus Jessica's total dollars after 10 years rounded to the nearest hundredth. Now, to do this, we need the compound interest formula, which is the total dollars equals the amount of principal times one plus the interest rate raised to the number of times the whole thing gets compounded. So let's take Tashawn and Jessica. Tashawn, $100 in principal. Interest rate is 2.5% or 0 0.025, and it gets compounded. It gets raised 10 times. Jessica's principal is 100. Her interest rate is 0 0.02 because it's 2%, and it also gets compounded 10 times. So at this point, we're just doing math. So Tashawn is 100 times 1.025 raised to the 10th. So 100 times 1.28008. The total is 128.008. We do the very same thing with Jessica, which is 100 times 1.02 raised to the 10th. We do that math. It's 100 times 1.21899. This is all calculator work, by the way. So her total is 121.899. We subtract these two totals. And we find that Tashan has 6.109 more than Jessica, but we have to round that. We have to round that to the nearest hundredth, so that becomes 6.11. Yeah, that's just a lot of calculator work. Nice job. Hey, you made it. Congratulations. If you found this video helpful, please remember to either hit the like button or the subscribe button to get lots more great videos just like this. Also wanted to remind you that we offer the complete SAT and ACT course for $50 and that has tons of walkthroughs just like, just like the one you did. The reason we offer it for 50 bucks is here at First Choice Admissions, we don't think the size of your wallet should limit the size of your opportunities and we wanna make sure that everybody can afford world-class test prep. Okay, there are details below if you're interested in the course. See you next time.